Welcome. My name is Mary Beth Callahan. I'm a practicing kidney social worker, and I have worked with patients with kidney disease since 1984. I currently work at Dallas Nephrology Associates in Dallas Transplant Institute. Today, we will talk about ways you might be able to slow kidney disease as we go through How to Have a Good Future with Kidney Disease, Part 3. Thank you for joining us today. The goal is to have your kidneys last as long as you live. If this doesn't happen, there are treatments that can help you have a good life, and we'll talk about those in other sessions. There are two main causes for kidney disease. These are diabetes and high blood pressure. So as you think about it, if you want to slow down chronic kidney disease, which sometimes we might refer to in our presentation as CKD, you need to try and work on the cause of kidney disease. So again, the two main causes for kidney disease are diabetes and high blood pressure, and we'll be talking a lot about those today. Here's what the whole picture looks like. Type 2 diabetes and high blood pressure equal about 70% of all kidney failure. Often, people have both diabetes and high blood pressure, and that's a double whammy. Some of the other causes of kidney failure include birth de defects, diseases of the kidneys filters, kidney stones, type 1 diabetes, and then there are other problems as well. Remember that we said to slow kidney disease, it's important to work on the cause. So, if what caused your kidney disease is something like lupus or FSGS, which the long name for is focal Regimotus. Did we start over? I think so. Hello. Hello, people. Oh. Hello. Hi. I think we should start over. Okay. Like from the Hello. beginning? From yeah. The beginning, so yeah. should I just say FSGS and not try to go into the words? Um, sure. Yeah. I mean, I think most people are probably, the doctors are probably talking about FSGS. I don't know if anybody is walking around saying focal segmental glomerulosclerosis, which is a serious mouthful. Okay. All right. I'm sorry. Let's go back. Can you cut it and start over? Um. Remember that we said to slow kidney disease, it's important to work on the cause. So, if what caused your kidney problem is something like lupus, FSGS, IgA nephropathy, or another illness, look it up. Sometimes it's hard to get all the information, but here are some suggestions. Ask your doctor how to spell the name of your condition. Go to the library and talk to the librarian. If there's a medical library near you, then that might even be better. Use the internet, but if you find information on the internet, be sure and go back and check it out with your doctor. There is so much new information these days that no one can keep up with it all. And remember to talk to your doctor about what you learn. You just might find your way to something that can help you. But it's always important to ask and ask and ask until you get answers that you understand. We're going to talk a little bit about diabetes. Since type 2 diabetes is the leading cause, we'll talk about that first. Some of you listening may have diabetes. The doctor may have recommended that you test your blood sugar a certain number of times a day. This is important because keeping your blood sugar in good control can slow the progression of chronic kidney disease. Know what your blood sugar is. Know how it reacts in relation to what you do 
and what you eat. And know that what you eat is the first step to keeping your blood sugar in control. Now, it's important to show these records of what you're learning about yourself to the doctor or to the dietitian or to the certified diabetes educator that you're working with. This information that you're keeping on yourself will help them help you. There are a few types of measures when you're looking at blood sugar control. One is the testing that you do daily, and usually more than once a day. And then there is something called the A1C. The A1C is usually done every three months. The A1C test result tells you your average blood sugar level for the past two or three months. Specifically, the A1C test measures what percentage of your hemoglobin, which is the protein in your red blood cells that carry oxygen, is coated with sugar. So the higher your A1C level, the poorer your blood sugar control, and the higher your risk of diabetes complication. So when your doctor does an A1C test, know your A1C and then ask the doctor what your target A1C should be. Remember, understanding and managing the cause of your chronic kidney disease can help delay the disease process. So it's all about trying to manage the cause of your chronic kidney disease. Staying in the target range your doctor gives you for blood sugar can help you protect your kidneys. Now, it can be complicated. Sweets and starchy foods like these in the picture can raise your blood sugar. Eating less of these foods can help you stay in the target range. However, this can be a hard change to make. Pat yourself on the back when you take baby steps towards your goal of eating less starchy foods and limiting sweets. Perhaps you can make a note right now to think later of how you might be able to make a change each week. Some ideas, some ideas, although I'm not a dietitian, are open face sandwiches, really thinking about the size of portions. You know, now I see in some of the stores these portion plates, which may or may not be the exact thing for you, but you could still talk to your doctor or dietitian about them and they might be helpful. And then counting carbs. So it's a whole new process and you might be even to able to make it like a game in some ways. But again, trying to work with the cause will help to delay kidney disease. Improving the way you eat and staying active can help you stay in your target range. All of these things are in your control, but it does take learning and it usually takes change. However, no one else can eat or exercise for you. So it has to be something that we somehow learn to do for ourselves and that we are somehow motivated to do for ourselves. Depending on your kidney function, you may need to limit fruits that are high in potassium, like dried fruits, mangoes, avocados, bananas, oranges. Ask your doctor or talk to a dietitian about your particular food needs. Very often they will have a flyer in their office that can help you and give you some guidance that you can put on your refrigerator. In some cases, people who lose weight may be able to stop taking diabetes medications. How much weight does someone have to lose? Well, a 2013 study in the journal General Internal Medicine found that losing 5 to 7% of body weight reduced the three-year risk of developing type 2 diabetes by 54%. Losing 10% of body weight 
reduced the three-year risk of developing type 2 diabetes by 85%. That's pretty encouraging numbers about something that we can do for ourselves, and yet I know that it's not easy to do this. And yet, just just real quickly again to review that, losing 5 to 7% of body weight reduced the three-year risk of developing type 2 diabetes by 54% and losing 10% uh, reduced the three-year risk of type 2 diabetes by 85%. Now, got to be careful with this because being malnourished can harm you. So you really need to be working with your doctor or dietitian to help you through this journey. Moderate protein limits are safe and may slow kidney disease. Talk to your doctor if you don't know whether or not to limit protein. It can be difficult to understand exactly what's right for you, and you may need to ask several times, and that's okay, because you're learning a lot. You might be making several changes, And so the information that you're getting, you may need to get that information several times. I know I do when I'm learning something new. So it's kind of tricky because protein is a key building block for your body. If you severely limit it, your body may break down muscle. If this happens, the wastes that form can cause more harm to your kidneys. The deck of cards in the picture here is uh, a sized protein serving of about three ounces. I checked with my dietician that I work with on that uh, today just to be sure. And I, I see her pulling things out of her drawer that look like some of these items from time to time. This means that you might not want to plan on big pieces of a protein food. Small pieces like this in a kebab or a salad or stir fry are a good way to get enough, but not too much. You may also want to speak to a dietitian that is familiar with kidney disease to help you manage all this. Now, your doctor may prescribe medications to lower your blood sugar. Now, sometimes when I've been working with patients and this idea comes up about lowering blood sugar, um, it it seems scary. And I guess it would be for me, too, um, because maybe, you know, someone who's had this experience before. But you have to remember, if you can, that you're trying to take care of the cause, again, of what might be hurting your kidneys. Sometimes it can seem like the beginning of something that may not end. But I'd like you to ask I'd like to ask you to think of it as protecting valuable real estate that's inside of you. Sometimes even after a person begins a medication, if there is a change in diet or weight loss, medications may lo- no longer be needed. But again, we're trying to reduce the cause of the problem that might be leading to kidney failure. However, medication can help to protect your kidneys. Now, sometimes it may be hard to get medications or it can be confusing to understand how to take them. If you're not sure how to take the medication, Ask your pharmacist, your doctor, or your certified diabetes specialist. And again, it may take more than one time of asking because it can be confusing. If you can't afford your medications, talk to your doctor. There may be a generic um, version of this. There may be samples, or there may be drug company programs to help you. Medicare Part D, Medicaid, or private insurance cover many diabetes drugs along with blood sugar meters, test strips, and lancets. Sometimes it just takes your doctor knowing that they need to change the name of the medication. There are several different medications in the same class that treat the same 
thing that are paid differently by different insurances. But our doctors don't know this necessarily. So let's not assume our doctor knows. Let's help them out. Uh, It's really hard to keep up with and it's very individualized by whatever insurance we have. If any of you are on dialysis, consider the social worker as a resource to see if a drug company can help. If you need insulin, knowing how to use it can help you stay in your target range. An ultra-long-lasting insulin, like Lantus, Levomir, or a new long-lasting insulin to J.O. may be able to help you manage. Every form of insulin comes in a pen and a vial. Many people find the pen form easier to use. Check with your doctor about this form. Sometimes an insulin pump can be used instead of multiple daily injections. It can give you better control. It's my experience that using a diabetic specialist called an endocrinologist may be the best to help you get an insulin pump approved through your insurance. An insulin pump has a reservoir for insulin and a tiny tube that goes into your skin. An insulin pump can give you basal insulin and bolus doses for meals. Um, As I mentioned a little earlier in this slide, Medicare, Medicaid, and private insurance may pay for insulin and an insulin pump. Now, kind of a caution, a common class of diabetes drugs called biguanides are not safe for you if your kidneys don't work well. And we kind of classify that as an estimated GFR below 30. And it's important that you know this so that you can talk to your doctors. And sometimes you might be meeting with a primary care physician. And so it's, again, important for you to put this out there and to question, to ask, and not assume that they um, may know all the information that you have. So if you're taking metformin, which might be called glucophage, glucovance, or combiglize, Talk to your doctor about when you may need to switch. Talk to your doctor before you stop taking the medication that he or she prescribes so that they can help you bridge to another medication. Now, let's switch to high blood pressure and your kidneys. Sometimes it's hard to know which came first. High blood pressure can cause kidney damage. Kidneys that are damaged can also stop doing a good job of controlling blood pressure. It's really not always possible to know which came first. Some of you listening to the webinar likely have high blood pressure. High blood pressure is the second cause of kidney failure, the second leading cause. Like blood sugar, knowing what your blood pressure is is the first step to getting it in control. Staying in the target range your doctor gives you can help to protect your kidneys. If you can afford one, a home blood pressure monitor is a great tool. Some people who can't afford a monitor go to the same pharmacy several times a week to make a blood pressure check. At home, you can check your blood pressure patterns a few times a day. Write down the results and look for patterns. Whichever way you take your blood pressure, bring the results to your doctor. These patterns can help your doctor sort out what is going on with you. The cardiovascular guidelines suggest in general, 130 systolic over 80 diastolic is a target range. However, this may not be the target range for you. So check with your doctor to find out. Now, the American Heart Association now recommends that we all 
linnet sodium in our diets to 1,500 milligrams per day. That's about three quarters of a teaspoon, whether we have kidney disease or not. Having worked in this field for as many years as I have, um, I've heard a lot about salt over the years, and um, I just really try not to salt things additionally to what's there because salt is hidden in a lot of our foods. Eating less salt or sodium can help you lower your blood pressure. One of the things I've learned over the years is that salt substitutes are often very high in potassium. And of course, for people who have chronic kidney disease, this can be very dangerous. It's very important to read the label, to check with your doctor, to check with your dietitian. Salt substitutes sound like a good idea, but the potassium that's in it can be a very dangerous idea. So be sure to check on this. The other thing that I've found over the years is that um, people often wonder if sea salt or kosher salt is still salt. And I have verified with my dietitian that it is still salt. And so we have to be careful of all those things. One of the things um, that she taught me many, many, many years ago was that one of the good products to use is a product like Mrs. Dash, which has a lot of different flavors now uh, that are low sodium. And I think that changing the way we eat foods, it takes a while for our taste to adjust and to become content with a difference in change. I know that um, using less salt and being satisfied with it doesn't necessarily happen overnight. It can be a process of becoming satisfied with less salt because we know we're working towards better health and protecting our kidneys. So it's just something to think about. It can be an important factor in blood pressure management. Did you know that many Americans eat fast food every day? And a lot of fast food is very high in salt, along with fat, trans fat, starch, and just plain calories. It sure is tasty, but not good for us or for our kidneys. You can get a whole day's worth of salt with just one menu item. Now, um, if you're on a limited budget or short on time, I know that it can be difficult to get out of the habit of eating salty, fast foods. In fact, across the street from where I work, there's a, an establishment that will sell two tacos for 99 cents, and it's very... Um, easy to think of going there and getting filled real quickly for that price. Um, but over time, I'd like to suggest to try and change to cooking something quick and easy at home, not a gourmet meal, and packing it for work. Even cutting it into bite-sized pieces that you can easily eat if you have to eat it on the go. Many fast food restaurants now have food sheets that they can give you with the breakdown of sodium, carbohydrates, etc. And I know personally that it was rather shocking when I reviewed that um, when I was trying to change some of my eating habits, but it was a good awareness at the same time. At restaurants where they cook to order, you can ask for food without added salt, MSG, salty sauces, or cheese on top. While this can be hard at first, with everyone else ordering off the menu without all the extras to ask for, so to speak, remember you are working for a cause to keep your kidney function as high as possible for as long as possible. About three-fourths of all the salt in most people's diet comes from processed foods. Yes, this was a disappointing and hard thing for me to come to grips with, being a lover of processed foods in the past. However, we have to think, what is the risk and the gain? You know, when I looked to my cabinet one day, I looked at all the things that came in packages 
and the things that were not fresh. And I thought to myself, I imagine all those things in packages had to be processed in some form or fashion. Um, here's some information about processed foods. These are raw ingredients that are transformed in some way, cooked, frozen, or dehydrated. Not all processed foods are bad, but some have a lot of sodium. Soups are some of the worst. Look for low-sodium versions of soup if you're going to have soup. Most processed meats like bacon, cold-cut salami, etc., have a lot of salt, too much salt to be good choices. Read ingredient lists on all meats. Some fresh meats are injected with salt or potassium. To identify this, you might look for the word enhanced on the label. Avoid these. Condiments like ketchup and soy sauce have a lot of salt. A lot of salt. Packaged side dishes and helper foods like hamburger helper have a great deal of salt as well. And I suggest to you, these changes are not, let's stop everything as soon as this webinar is over, but let's think about this and make a plan for a better future. And, you know, for me, it's important to take things in baby steps when I'm making changes. Uh, and the baby steps can go out into the future. But if I try to tackle too much at one time, I'm generally not going to be able to achieve it. And so a suggestion I might have for you is to make a list of baby steps that, you know, when you finish one, you might go to the next and just recognize your progress along the way. Most foods have labels that look something like this to help us make good choices. Now, does does this look like a good food choice to protect your kidneys? Let's see, the sodium is at 14.85, and this is a serving size of one bag. Um, so you may be limited to 2,000 milligrams of sodium a day. If that were the case, this probably would not be a good food choice. I'm thinking that this is probably not a good food choice regardless, but <laughs> uh, just something to think about. We really need to try and be aware of the sodium content in food. And um, I know that the U.S. has worked very hard to get nutrition facts on uh, food for us, and I think it can be very helpful. helpful. So keep a close eye on serving sizes. A serving size may be in grams or ounces, and even if the food comes in a bag, it could still be two or three servings, and that's always one that tricks me up, two or three servings instead of one. If you eat more than one serving, you get more of everything, including the sodium. Um, and this is just a sample food label, hopefully not a real food. Some things you do to manage high blood sugar also help with high blood pressure. Eating lots of vegetables can help. So can exercise with your doctors okay. Depending on your kidney function, you may need to limit fruits that are high in potassium, as we discussed before, like dried fruits, mangoes, avocados, bananas, and oranges. Ask your doctor. Some vegetables are also high in potassium, like tomatoes and potatoes. Just a note, a randomized controlled trial in the United Kingdom found that two grams of cinnamon a day significant, significantly reduced the hemoglobin A1C and blood pressure. Something to check with your doctor about. Another thing that might help blood pressure is trying some relaxation practices. These might be things like Tai Chi, Qigong, yoga, meditation, prayer, listening to soothing music. None of these will hurt you, and some may help. 
you may have other calming techniques that if you stop for a few minutes and think about, what do I do sometimes that helps me to feel calmer? Think about that. Write it down. You may want to try it during certain times if you're feeling like these are moments when my blood pressure may be getting higher. You may want to start doing it on a regular basis several times a day. Medications are often used to help lower blood pressure. The first line of treatment for high blood pressure is a diuretic most times, a water pill. While your kidneys work, Diuretics help rid your body of extra water. Medications only work if we take them. So if for some reason you really aren't taking a medication that the doctor prescribed, be sure and tell the doctor. You really don't want the doctor to prescribe an additional medication because they think the first one didn't work when really you haven't been able to take the first one for some reason. So I really encourage you to talk it out uh, so that you can get to the right level of medication you need for the problem that you're having. If side effects or cost keep you from taking the medicine, talk to your doctor. There may be other drugs that will be easier for you to take or less costly. Many blood pressure meds have been around for a long time, Ask about generics to save money. Two types of blood pressure pills can help protect kidneys. They're called ACE inhibitors and angiotensin receptor blockers, easierly said as ARBs. These are very helpful in diabetes or diseases where there is protein in the urine. An ACE inhibitor can cause a nagging dry cough. So if you've started one, it's important to let your doctor know if you're having a cough. If this happens, you may need to switch to an ARB. Not on an ACE inhibitor or an ARB, you may want to ask your doctor if one might help you. If you have side effects from blood pressure medications like dry mouth or erectile dysfunction, tell your doctor. There may be others that you can try. Remember, you are the most important person in the treatment plan. Without your feedback to the doctor, they're not going to be able to make the best choices for you. Now, non-steroidal anti-inflammatory pain pills, or NSAIDs, are a rare cause of kidney failure, but they are a cause of kidney failure most often if they are taken daily for a year or more. But it can be a problem in other situations as well. Most NSAIDs are over-the-counter. Avoid these. Tylenol, which may also be called acetafenamine, is not an NSAID, but it can also cause kidney damage. Talk to your doctor about Tylenol. Some of these are prescription also might be called Indocin, Feldine, Relifin, or Celebrex. Most commonly, more meds can make CKD, or chronic kidney disease, progress faster. If you must take one of these once in a while and are not on dialysis, take them with a full glass of water. Again, it's best not to take these. And it's definitely best for your kidneys if you don't rely on these for daily pain relief. Talk to your doctor about something else to take for pain relief. Also talk to your doctor about other options like whether cold or heat, physical therapy, biofeedback or acupuncture, a TENS unit, which is electrical stimulation that um, you get by placing little pads in um, certain areas of your body that doesn't hurt at all uh, might bring you, or the elimination of foods or medication allergens to get a different type of pain relief. All 
of these recreational drugs and others can harm your kidneys? To find out, Google the drug name and the word kidneys. If you use them and need help to stop, talk to your doctor. You may be asked about the effects of marijuana on the kidneys. There are currently no good studies, but certainly caution is advisable. And if you're going to apply for transplant, which is something we'll talk about in another series, there's the risk of uh, an infection if you're smoking mar marijuana uh, after transplant while you're on immunosuppressive drugs. So um, these things are very harmful to your kidneys. Now, most of us know that smoking is bad for us. We've all heard that smoking causes lung cancer and heart disease. But most people don't realize that smoking also speeds up kidney disease. The tiny filters inside your kidneys are blood vessels, and smoking gums up these blood vessels. So with each cigarette, um, you're quickening the uh, loss of kidney function. So it's something to really think about if it's possible to stop smoking. Um, smoking is a difficult addiction to stop, but you can stop. Perhaps you've tried to stop smoking before and it hasn't worked. It's hard to try again and think about it not working. I'd suggest getting help in one form or another. Some of the products listed on this slide um, have 24-hour hotlines to help you figure out what might be the best way for you to work toward taking the last cigarette. You can talk to your doctor about ways to quit. He or she can prescribe products like these, or there are other options. Quitting smoking is one of the best gifts that you can give your kidneys. Um, Medicare or insurance may help pay for smoking cessation programs. Um, if you need a resource to help you stop smoking, you can also contact the American Cancer Society at their 1-800 number or at their location nearest to you. What about x-ray dye tests? Remember, you are the central part of your care plan. And if your doctor orders an x-ray dye test, ask how it will affect your kidneys. Contrast dye can harm your kidneys. Tell the radiologist that you have kidney problems. The doctor may be able to use contrast, do an ultrasound instead of an x-ray, dilute the dye, or give you medications like mucomist. During an x-ray dye test, Using an IV with bicarbonate instead of plain saline can help protect your kidneys. Avoid gadolinium, which can cause a problem with nephrogenic systemic fibrosis, or NSF, in people whose kidneys don't work well. Please ask questions. Don't hesitate to ask questions. Now, some medications are removed from your body by your liver. Some are removed from our bodies by our kidneys. When your kidneys are not at full strength, some medications can harm you or cause further kidney damage. Medications include those over-the-counter products, those that a doctor prescribes, and don't forget the herbal or folk remedies. These can be harmful as well. It's safest to ask before you take a new med, just in case. This is especially true if a doctor other than your nephrologist pre prescribes something for you. Remember, ask, ask, ask. So today's takeaways. You can take steps to slow chronic kidney disease. You really can. Learn the cause, and if you can, treat the cause. Control blood pressure and blood sugar. If you smoke, 
quit. Be cautious about new medications and x-ray dye tests. We want to give you these options to learn more about some of the things that we've spoken about. And we really appreciate you joining us today in this webinar. Thank you.